My name is Joanne Horning, and I am the founder and executive director of the San Francisco Bay Area affiliate of Susan G. Komen. Thank you for joining us for the first presentation of our educational web series. These monthly discussions are focused on current breast cancer issues and presented by prominent Bay Area physicians and researchers. Today, I am pleased to present Dr. George Sledge, Jr., Professor and Chief of Oncology at Stanford University, as well as Chief Scientific Medical Advisor to Susan G. Komen. Dr. Sledge will discuss the new biology of breast cancer and its therapeutic implications. At Susan G. Komen, our goal is to save lives and end breast cancer forever. Thank you for joining us. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. George Sledge, and it's my pleasure to discuss the new biology of breast cancer and its therapeutic implications with you. First, some disclosures. I think in looking at treatments for breast cancer, and indeed looking at the biology of breast cancer, we need to know several things. Uh, as in this wonderful Paul Gauguin painting, where do we come from, what are we today, and where are we going, always represent important questions. Now, I'll be discussing a number of things today. First, and most importantly, the, the concept of breast cancer as a family of diseases. Then I'll be looking at members of that family, the estrogen receptor positive tumors, tumors that are HER2 positive, and finally, and challengingly, triple negative breast cancers. Now, to begin, if we go back a, a little more than a decade, what we learned as a result of studying studies of the biology of breast cancer is that breast cancer is not one disease, but rather a family of diseases. I like to think of it as a group of criminals who share the same boarding house. Some of them are petty thieves, some of them are killers. They need to be apprehended differently, and they need to be punished differently. Now, because of this, breast cancer as a disease and as a therapeutic area has gone from being fairly white bread and simple and monoform to something fairly complex, something much more like a layer cake. If we look at breast cancer today, we can break breast cancer down into a number of different subtypes. Certainly the largest group is a group of tumors that are estrogen sensitive tumors. Now, on top of that, we have two smaller groups, a HER2 positive group that represents perhaps 15% of cases, and then a basaloid or triple negative or basal-like breast cancers that again represent another 10 to 15% of patients. And these different family members all have different attributes and all need to be looked at in different ways. So let's begin with estrogen receptor positive disease. If we look at estrogen receptor positive disease, what we are thinking about is the biology of estrogen. Estrogen freely crosses the cell membrane of cancer cells. It binds within the cell to the estrogen receptor. The estrogen receptor, in turn, goes into the nucleus of the cell where it tells the DNA in the cell's nucleus to start doing things. And those things lead to the growth, spread, and metastasis, and many other biologic actions that are mediated by estrogen. These, in turn, can be blocked through drugs such as tamoxifen, which prevent estrogen from binding to the estrogen receptor, or drugs such as aromatase inhibitors, uh, which reduce the amount of circulating estrogen in the blood by shutting off the enzyme that converts other hormones to estrogen. We've known for a good long time now that if we use these agents, we can significantly reduce the risk of recurrence of patients with early stage breast cancer. And this reduction in recurrence, in turn, has led to a significant reduction in terms of the number of women with early stage breast cancer who ultimately go on to die of breast cancer. However, as this figure shows, we still have a long ways to go. There are still all too many women who are recurring and dying with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Now, another problem that we faced in this population is the problem that many of these patients uh, receive chemotherapy. However, only a few are likely to benefit. Somewhere close to 140,000 women annually are diagnosed with this type of disease but perhaps 80 to 85% do not benefit from chemotherapy, 
And among the women who benefit from chemotherapy, there's a small absolute benefit, perhaps a 5% reduction in mortality. This is still important, but treating many women to benefit a few has always been a problem for both patients and physicians. Now, part of the answer to this solution uh, has been to develop the Oncotype DX assay. Uh, this assay uh, is one in which uh, we look at a collection of different cancer-related genes, some of which are associated with the estrogen receptor, some of which are associated with cell proliferation, uh, others of which are associated with invasion and metastasis genes or genes involved in HER2. We put all of these together. We come up with a mathematical algorithm, and this algorithm, in turn, uh, allows us to predict certain things about the biology of estrogen receptor positive disease. And indeed, if one looks at a population of women who have lymph node de negative disease, most of whom would be cured with local therapy alone or local therapy plus hormonal therapy, we can now separate out women into a group that's at relatively low risk for recurrence, overall a less than 10% risk of recurrence, uh, 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 as well as a group of women who are at higher risk of recurrence, and indeed, in the case of high recurrence score patients, very high risk of recurrence. Knowing this, knowing how this affects the prognosis of breast cancer patients, of course, can be important in terms of deciding which women will or will not receive treatment. Now, above and beyond this, knowing the recurrence score having a good sense of the genes that are driving the cancer allows us to pick out a group of women who are not only at higher risk of recurrence, but also who are at significantly greater likelihood of benefiting from chemotherapy. And indeed, as, as this study and indeed many other confirmatory studies have now shown, if one has a low risk of, of, of recurrence, indeed a low recurrence score, these women are highly unlikely to benefit from chemotherapy in contrast women with a high recurrence score are highly likely to benefit. There's a population in between that we're still working on with intermediate recurrence scores where ongoing studies will give us a better idea of whether or not chemotherapy has any benefit at all. Now, for women who have recurrent breast cancer, we have many different types of hormonal therapy. But what we've learned over time is that hormonal therapy tends to be a wasting asset. Uh, that is to say, with each progression in the metastatic setting, fewer women are likely to benefit from a hormonal therapy. What can we do about this? Well, we've started to, in recent years to look at the question of why women develop resistance to hormonal therapies. One of the reasons is, is what doctors call crosstalk, and that is to say that different growth factor receptors, such as the estrogen receptor and other growth factors, such as, for instance, HER2, or the insulin-like growth factor, they talk to each other. And indeed, by talking to each other, they're able to get around resistance. This is, involves a number of complex pathways that we don't need to go into in great depth. The important thing here is that as we've investigated these pathways, we've found certain crucial points where by blocking the pathways, we can prevent the crosstalk that allows cancers to get around the problem of estrogen receptor-related resistance. And in particular, the first of these to look at, be looked at is something called mTOR. We now have drugs that target mTOR. One on the market is called Everolimus. This drug, when it's combined with an aromatase inhibitor, significantly prolongs the time until progression of disease for, for patients with breast cancer, as shown in the slide from the Bolero 2 talk. Uh, we're currently further exploring this to see whether or not we might be able to do a better job, uh, particularly for patients with earlier stages of disease. But this was one of the first steps forward in recent years to show that we might be able to overcome resistance to hormonal therapy in the clinic. Now, we've also been looking at other issues related to estrogen receptor caused growth of cancers. This lovely picture shows uh, two breast cancer cells splitting apart from each other as they've undergone the process of cell division. And this picture and others like it have led cancer researchers to ask a very important but very simple question. Once estrogen binds to the estrogen receptor, 
why does that cause breast cancer cells to divide? And hence, why does that cause breast tumors to grow? And we've learned that, in fact, binding of estrogen to the estrogen receptor is only the first part of a fairly complex chain of events that leads to cell division. Uh, by studying these pathways, we've been able to find crucial points where we can interfere and can prevent cell division. And in particular, doctors in recent years have looked at something called CDK4 and CDK6 as a crucial, crucial place where we might be able to block cell growth. Looking at this on the next slide, if, if we think of this as perhaps a steam engine, an old-style steam engine, think of estrogen as the coal that one throws in the furnace of the, of the steam engine and think of the estrogen receptor as, as being that furnace. Once estrogen has bound to the estrogen receptor, there are still many steps left before the train goes down the track. And in particular, if we think of CDK4 and 6 as, as the piston, and if we somehow interfere with the, the, the piston, then perhaps both taking the coal away and interfering the, with the piston will do a better job. And in fact, that's the case. Uh, both in combination with an aromatase inhibitor or in combination uh, with fulvestrin, another hormonal agent that we use to treat metastatic breast cancer, we know that combined blockade with two agents is significantly better than just using a single agent. And indeed, this has led to the recent approval of a drug called palbocyclib by the Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of patients with metastatic breast cancer. And indeed, this is now being moved into the early stage setting in trials to see whether or not we can lower the risk of a woman having a recurrence of her breast cancer with early stage breast cancer. Now, let's move on now uh, to HER2. Uh, HER2 has been one of the great success stories in breast cancer in recent years as we've learned more about the biology of HER2 positive disease and as have new agents have come along, we've transformed our ability to treat these patients. HER2 is part of a, a family of growth factor receptors, what is known as the epidermal growth factor receptor family. And HER2 in particular is present in roughly 15% of patients with early stage breast cancer where it's known to be an important driver of growth, invasion, and metastasis. Other members of this family are also important, not just for breast cancer, for, but for many other cancers. Now, the important thing about HER2 is that we're able to measure it in the clinic. We can measure it uh, either with what's known as immunohistochemistry or, as is shown here, with, with what's called fluorescence in situ hybridization, or FISH. And between these techniques, pathologists have gotten increasingly good in recent year, years in identifying those patients who would be most likely to benefit from therapy that targets HER2. And this has led to the development of a number of agents. In particular, the first of these, uh, trastuzumab or Herceptin, came along and was shown to significantly reduce the likelihood of a woman having a recurrence of her breast cancer and significantly reduce her likelihood of dying of HER2 positive breast cancer. And indeed, this has been transformative for, for, this, for this disease, both for early stage patients and for patients with advanced or metastatic breast cancer. Uh, however, looking at the analysis of patients who've, who've received treatment for this disease, it's still obvious that we have some ways to go in terms of further lowering the risk of dying of breast cancer among HER2 positive patients. And we've been working on that actively over the last decade. Now, after trastuzumab, an antibody, uh, two HER2-positive breast cancers came along. Uh, doctors started looking at multiple other different approaches uh, for treating HER2-positive disease. Some of these involve blocking what's known as the kinase dom domain, the, the internal part of the HER2 molecule, the business end of the molecule. Other approaches have, have involved new antibodies, such as pertuzumab or progetta, that block other parts of how HER2 works, and in particular prevents HER2 from linking up with other molecules that stimulate growth. We can use HER2 as, as, as a delivery device by taking an, an antibody to HER2, and attaching a poison to it, 
and then using the HER2 molecule to internalize that poison and poison the cancer cell. Or we can use other agents, such as Everolimus that we mentioned previously for mTOR or drugs that target something else called PI3 kinase that are part of the downstream mechanisms by which HER2 drives cancer cells. All of these have been studied in the clinic, and we already have excellent evidence that, of benefit for some of these. Now, in particular, one of the things that we've learned about the biology of this disease is that HER2 works primarily as a result of hooking up with other members of the epidermal growth factor receptor family. And this hooking up is what doctors call dimerization. And once two of these molecules have dimerized, have hooked up with each other, this is what leads to the negative actions of HER2 on the, on the breast cancer cell. So can we block this hooking up? Can we prevent this hooking up? And in fact, we can. Uh, if we think of this as a, as a, as a chaperone that's uh, uh, preventing hookups uh, uh, be, between two receptors, uh, pertuzumab does a very good job of this. And in preclinical studies, the combination of pertuzumab, the new antibody, with the old antibody, trastuzumab, appeared to add significant benefit. This in turn led to large clinical trials, such as the beautifully named Cleopatra trial for patients with advanced disease where we looked at the old approach of giving the combination of chemotherapy uh, and trastuzumab or Herceptin to a new approach in which we gave chemotherapy along with two antibodies now, trastuzumab and pertuzumab. What were the results? Well, we saw significant improvements in terms of progression-free survival. More importantly, for patients with metastatic breast cancer, we saw a huge improvement in terms of overall survival for patients with the disease. Now, other approaches have also been looked at for the treatment of patients with metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer. One of the more interesting ones involves something called TDM1. Now, TDM1 is the old trastuzumab antibody to which we've attached a plant poison, what's known as DM1. TDM1 then binds to the breast cancer cell by attaching HER2. It's dragged inside the breast cancer cell, and then inside the breast cancer cell, the antibody is taken apart by what are known as lysosomes inside the, the cell, and this leads to the release of the drug, uh, the plant poison, which now poisons the cancer cell and prevents it from dividing and hopefully kills it. And this approach works in the clinic. It significantly prolongs survival of patients whose tumors have progressed through other HER2-targeted therapy. And this has led to the approval of this drug by the Food and Drug Administration and by the American Society of Clinical Oncology in, in recent years, recommending that patients should receive the two-antibody approach of trastuzumab and pertuzumab along with a chemotherapy drug as first-line therapy for metastatic disease. And then to use TDM1, otherwise known as CADSILA, as second-line treatment for the disease. And this is certainly affecting how patients with this disease are being treated at a national level today. So let's move on now to the, the final family of, that we need to worry about in, term, in terms of breast cancer. And this is the so-called triple negative or basal breast cancer family. Triple negative because these tumors lack estrogen receptor, they lack progesterone receptor, and they lack HER2. Now, these tend to be the pug uglies of the breast cancer world. They have a high nuclear grade when one looks at them under the microscope. They're all rapidly dividing. The cancers that are inherited cancers, such as BRCA1, tend to fall within this group. These cancers are relatively sensitive to chemotherapy, but the problem is that's all they're sensitive to. So if one's tumor progresses on chemotherapy, uh, one is, then has to go to another chemotherapy and yet another chemotherapy, and this represents a problem, obviously, for patients. These cancers also appear to have some differential sensitivity to some types of chemotherapy, uh, probably because these tumors are, are frequently inherited cancers and because their inheritance involves problems with repairing DNA damage. Drugs that damage DNA do a better job of killing these cancer cells. Now, what really characterizes these, these cancers is, is, is what I like to call genomic chaos. 
And that's to say, in contrast to HER2, where we know that HER2 is the primary driver of the cancer, if we look at all of the, the genes that are altered in these triple negative breast cancers, shown in the upper left panel, the first thing that, that you need to know is that there's a lot of them. This is not a problem of finding just a single magic bullet. There's a lot of different targets there that represent problems. And most of these targets are rare. Most of them represent infrequent and highly vexing problems, both for the patient and for the doctor caring for the patient. And this has led us to think of, of triple negative breast cancer basically as a collection of orphan diseases, a myriad of rare diseases with many different genetic drivers. Uh, information technology is obviously going to be very important in terms of understanding them. They're going to have very complex biology just because there's so many different types. This in turn is going to lead to uncertain therapeutics and it's going to make it very hard to do the large phase 3 trials that we've done in the past and which have done so much to inform us about treatment of these cancers. Because these cancers are highly mutagenic, because they're changing all the time, because these mutations frequently lead to drug resistance, I like to think of this as breast cancer as whack-a-mole. You knock down one mole and another one pops up. This rapid emergence of, of, of resistance represents a big problem in treatments for this disease. And indeed, chaos reigns for these cancers. This represents a real issue for us. Now, these cancers appear to be differentially sensitive to chemotherapy, as I've mentioned. We've actually studied this in, in, in large phase three trials. And indeed, if one looks at these trials at drugs that target DNA versus other chemotherapy drugs that don't target DNA, as was done in, in what's known as the TNT trial, what's been found is that the drugs that target DNA are a whole lot likelier to, to work if one has a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, and indeed roughly, roughly twice the response rate if one has an inherited mutation compared to patients with triple negative breast cancers who do not have the inherited mutation. And this in turn leads to a, a difference in terms of how long uh, patients remain progression-free for their cancer. Now, because of this, because we've learned increasingly that DNA damage repair may be important for some of these cancers, this has led to new approaches for treating these cancers. And in particular, this has led to the idea that if we further interfere with DNA damage repair by shutting off an enzyme known as PARP, maybe this combination of having an, an inherent problem with DNA damage repair plus adding another DNA damage repair problem could make these cancers very sensitive to DNA damage in chemotherapy agents. And this in turn has led to a number of interesting early trials and now very, very large phase three trials, several of which are ongoing, to see whether or not we might be able to improve the outcome of these patients by the addition of PARP inhibitors with chemotherapy. This works in the laboratory. In the laboratory, if one combines a PARP inhibitor with, with a chemotherapy agent, one gets a huge improvement in terms of our ability to kill cancer cells. But the final test of this hypothesis will be in the clinic, and hopefully sometime in the near future we'll have the answer to this question. But again, the same problem exists. This is the problem of genomic instability. Lewis Carroll and his Through the Looking at Glass, I think, uh, uh, faced this problem with what's known as the Red Queen hypothesis, something that evolutionary biologists are fond of thinking about. Now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And this has been the problem in, uh, over the years. We've had to run in the same place with one chemotherapy agent after another and sooner or later of course the patient gets tired and the tumor gets smarter. Can we do a better job? Can we actually take new approaches that will be able to bring us closer to our hope for a goal of, of, of cure for patients with this, this disease. Well, one interesting observation that we've learned is that cancers, or I should say cancer cells, don't just live by themselves. They live in neighborhoods. So can we enlist the neighborhood watch to help uh, 
take on these, these cancers. If one thinks, ag then again, of a criminals inhabiting a particular neighborhood, can the neighborhood watch help throw, throw them out? Well, we, we certainly have learned uh, that uh, if one looks at triple negative breast cancers that have uh, large numbers of what, what are known as lymphocytes, the white blood cells that help fight cancer, uh, and that if these infiltrate the cancer, patients in general do a whole lot better. One is less likely to die or recur if one has lots of lymphocytes helping to fight the disease. Can we help out by taking in particular the lymphocytes that are known as T-cells, uh, the body's primary uh, line of immune defense against cancers, and making them stronger, making them better in terms of cancing, uh, attacking the cancer. Can we get them to do the job that, that, that they should be doing? Well, what we've learned is that these immune cells, these T cells, have many on and off buttons. And we can turn on some things and turn off others and thereby make these more active in terms of treating the cancer. Uh, these on and off switches have lots of complicated names. I won't go through these other than to say that some of the off switches uh, will allow a T cell to get, get more active. Some of the on switches will allow them to get more active. One of the big problems has been that cancer cells, in fact, are capable of turning T cells off by interacting with some of, some, some of the off switches on, on these cells. Well, this has led to the development of a number of new immunotherapy drugs, so-called checkpoint inhibitors, uh, that are now being introduced into cancer, and in particular into breast cancer. Now, in many human cancers, such as lung cancer or melanoma, the introduction of these cancers has been, in, into these cancers of the immune checkpoint inhibitors has been transformative. We're now trying to see whether or not something similar will happen in triple negative breast cancers with drugs such as pembrolizumab shown here, but also several other uh, antibody therapies that are so-called immune checkpoint inhibitors. The early data from these in triple negative breast cancers looks promising for some patients. Some patients go into remissions, and some of these remissions last a good long time. Hopefully we'll see more and more of this as we go forward with not just a few patients responding, as shown on this slide, but rather many patients responding as we go forward. The early data with this approach shows that roughly one in five patients will have a major response, and many of these responses are now projected to be lasting for more than a year. And this, in turn, has led to the development of so-called phase two trials, and then increasingly the development, the early development of so-called phase three trials that hopefully will get us closer to having these drugs available for patients in the clinic. Well, with that, I'll come to an end. Uh, the, the journey of, uh, of therapy in breast cancer has been largely a journey of a better understanding of the biology. Knowing more about the biology of the cancer, being able to support the research that will investigate that biology should bring us closer to new treatments for the disease. Organizations uh, such as Susan G. Komen have played an important role in terms of supporting the researchers who are coming up with the new treatments for the disease and, of course, supporting the patients who have to deal with this disease. Thank you ever so much for listening to me today.